Hello, my name is Stefan Blumentrat. I work as a researcher at the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research, NINA, in Oslo. Today, I want to tell you about some of our recent work on mapping potential migration hindrances in Norwegian freshwater networks. I'm an environmental planner by education, and because planning is a political process aimed at rational decision-making based on available information, I focused during my career on geographic information systems, in short, GIS. Because all environmental issues have a spatial component, one way or the other. And that is also true for migration hindrances, of course. <clears throat> so they are related to some specific places. In my talk, I will give you some insight into how modern information technology can help to address the problem of fragmentation or connectivity of freshwater networks in an efficient way. As with all conservation problems, resources to address them are limited, and managers need information to apply the limited resources in an efficient way. Questions managers regularly need to ask to answer <clears throat> are amongst others. Where are potential migration barriers or hindrances? Localizing them also helps to understand the extent of the problem. And there are a lot of different structures, both man-made and natural, that can hamper fish and other species migration or dispersal. Not all of them are complete barriers, and not all of them affect all species equally. So another important question is which effect potential migration hindrances in fact have. Closely related to that is the question what impact they have, for example, how much of the natural habitat of species do they impact negatively. In order to prioritize potential conservation measures like restoration or mitigation, costs are of course also an important issue. As some of my colleagues explore in the EU project Odysseus at the moment, in some cases migration or dispersal barriers can even have positive effects. Seen from the perspective of a native fish species, for example, structures that limit the dispersal of invasives can actually be a good thing. Finally, when faced with applications on infrastructure development and other important, another important question it is whether we should be extra careful at some places. So in order to address these questions, we cannot only look at the individual structures isolated. We need to see them in the context of the river network and consider both the overall effect of migration hindrances as well as contributions of individual stru structures. That requires good data on network and migration hindrances. <clears throat> so where can we get that kind of data? Most common data sources on potential migration hindrances are data collected by public authorities. The map on the right side shows points that represent dams registered in the Norwegian water and energy directorate. These data cover mostly larger structures. In order to fill this information gap that exists in many European countries, the AMBER project set out to supplement those public data <clears throat> by a citizen science-based approach. The drawback of citizen science data, however, is that they are not collected systematically and depend on mostly local enthusiasm, which is great, but rarely provides us with a covering data set. So the data available today lacks especially information on smaller structures and natural hindrances. A common approach to identify potential migration barriers um, is to look at the gradient of or slope in the river network. In a recent study, Perrin and others found average slope in the river network to be a good predictor for recognition rate of pike in rotten non treated lakes in Sweden. Rotten non treatment has been a means to extinguish populations of non native species, including pike and water bodies. So if pike makes it back up again, from other populations downstream, that gives us an idea about the dispersal or migration capacity of that species. 
And with that information on slope in the river network that is limiting the dispersal of migration, we can actually predict well, we can expect the species to show up. For example, based on new introductions of that species in a given lake. In the map, you see a simulation of an introduced species in the yellow lake and the consequences that we would expect from that. Well, we expect type to show up based on the topography. And in the InvaFish project, we made the set up a database for Scandinavia where risk of the secondary dispersal of invasive species can be estimated with a button click in QGIS. In QGIS, we, made, we defined an action that queries the database for which other lakes that are accessible from a given focal lake, given the dispersal capacity of the species. While that may sound rather straightforward, an issue is the quality of the available network data. <clears throat> so the image in the upper left, uh, there you can see the official Norwegian river network data laid over a high resolution terrain model. As you can see, there is a significant mismatch between terrain structures and the network data. That is obviously leading to errors if one wants to detect migration barriers from slope in the stream stubway. River networks derived, derived from the terrain model, as shown in the lower panel, are an alternative data source that makes the river network following more closely the terrain, thus allowing such analysis at unprecedented uh, detail, potentially also identifying smaller stream structures as uh, with manu manually digitizing uh, that is used for the official network data. However, there's a catch to it. Due to the airborne data acquisition, for example, roads, railroads, and other tracks crossing the river network appear as dams in the terrain model and can significantly alter the river network data derived from the terrain model. You can see this on the right panel where a railroad track of 25 meters high crosses the stream and alters the topology of the river network completely. So if we want to use this promising data source with high resolution terrain data, we need to correct those artifacts that we see. For that, we tested mainly three different algorithms for hydrological correction of digital elevation models that should be able to mend those artifacts by cutting through them. Those algorithms are available in the rich DM toolset, the GAT white box, and the dedicated algorithm names IJGIS Carve. Unfortunately, our initial tests did not yield the result which we hoped for. Either they were not applicable to the amount of data required to cover large catchments with high resolution terrain models, or they failed to correct high and long structures that were present in our study areas with culverts of up to 150 meters length. So therefore, we wrote an algorithm based on GRASS-GIS, an open source geographic information system. By the way, colleagues from the CTU in Prague contributed significantly to the development of GRASS-GIS and some of the underlying functions we have been using. The process of that algorithm is as follows. First, things are identified. Sinks are areas in the digital elevation model that where water is visually dammed up. In addition, channels that are terrain structures often representing streams are identified. Then the sinks are connected to the channels in the lower terrain and the resulting connection lines are ranked for each sink with regards to which one is the one most likely to represent a culvert. A first visual assessment has been quite promising. Though we are currently conducting a more thorough quantitative evaluation of the algorithm, where we check all potential culverts within selected squares of one by one kilometer. You see the uh, QGIS based uh, data input for the validation on the right hand side. 
Here we look for both culverts <coughs> that were identified correctly, culverts that were not in, identified, as well as false positives, meaning identified culverts that cannot be found in reality. While the quantitative evaluation seems to confirm the first visual assess assessment up to now, we already identified possible improvement, mainly in flat areas like mires or between lakes, where channel structures are missing. We also think that the evaluation results can be used to improve data filtering using machine learning technology. Still, <coughs> The main improvements compared to existing algorithms is that it's applicable to massive digital elevation models, thanks to the efficient tools in GraphGIS we built upon. So it scales to entire catchments with high resolution terrain data. Furthermore, structures with up to 150 meter length have been handled quite well. For example, where streams underpass several lanes of a motorway or a railroad track running in parallel. And you can see the case that we showed earlier with the railroad track, where this has been handled by the algorithm. So when we finally have got network data available, locations where roads and railroads cross the network, as well as public data on culverts, stems, and the like, together with fish occurrence data, we can put all that together and start analyzing. For the necessary processing, Using available data in Norway, we set up a Python script where we utilize the iGraph network analysis library for a study in Agder County in southern Norway. We then finally can start addressing some of the questions I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. As you can see on the map on the left hand side, we found only 118 dams of the 3,887 registered in the Norwegian Water and Energy Directorate within our study area. However, we identified more than 100,000 locations where roads, tracks, and trails cross the terrain-derived river network. Utilizing network analysis, we can count how many potential culverts that are located downstream from a given river segment, illustrating in the map on the right-hand side. This map tells us how many culverts a migratory fish would have to cross to reach a particular river section coming from the sea. My colleague Richard Hatcher showed in a recent study that the number of culverts downstream significantly contributes to explaining the prevalence of migratory sea trout in electrofishing sites. On the map on the right hand side, you also see overlaid known occurrences of European eel and the river <coughs> sections downstream from them. Another layer of information we can extract from the map data is the maximum slope or gradient in the river network. A fish would have to pass to reach a given section of the river network. You can see this in the map on the left tab. Again, overlaid with known occurrences of European eel. That can help us describing potential habitat of that species where we would want to focus mitigation or restoration efforts. With the help of network analysis, we can also measure how many kilometers of river network upstreams that are affected by a given culvert as illustrated in the map on the right. And we can select those culverts particularly that are located downstreams of known occurrences of vulnerable species, so even further limiting the possible mitigation measures. Concluding. The take home message from my talk should be that geographic information systems can provide relevant information for managers on fish migration and dispersal issues. There is, as with all technology, of course, a lot of improvement potential, like predicting the possibility of structures using topographic and hydrological characteristics, like Danukovsky, Hartley, and others, or Richard Hedger, and others did. Another perspective is to integrate species distribution models. Also recently developed environmental DNA technology can help to improve the usefulness of the presented approaches. Finally, I want to emphasize that all digital and virtual analysis depend on field data. So this does not replace activity on the ground, but it might help to prioritize and use resources more efficiently. 
And on that note, I'd like to thank you for following my talk and special thanks to the many colleagues that contributed to the work that I've been presenting today.